you know, a recession is coming um, and, and people need to be prepared for that. I expect to see recessionary condition, uh, conditions metastasize around the world and I expect to see that be a drag on growth. But the response to that is going to be more stimulus uh, and that, I suspect, is when you're going to see inflation really kick in and that will, I suspect, drive commodities significantly higher. Special coverage from the Rule Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida is brought to you by Contango Ore, developing Alaska's next gold mines. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman, I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy on Twitter, and we're here in Boca Raton at the Rule Symposium, where, where they're hosting phenomenal keynotes, and one of them is sitting across from me right now, Grant <laughs> Williams. Grant, it's, it's great to see you again in person. We like last it. saw each other in uh, in January, I believe, in Vancouver. That's right, yeah. And I'm uh, right. really looking forward to catching Time up flies, with you huh? again. Uh, yeah. lot, lots to talk about, of course. And uh, I had the pleasure of watching your presentation this morning, a replay. I didn't get a chance to go, go see it live. You're a busy man, you're a busy man. But, uh, we, we need to dissect it a bit and then go run through it because I think it's quite interesting. You made some really, really interesting points and uh, investing versus speculating, I think, is the main yeah. topic. Um, who, who are you? Yeah, look, I mean, the, the, the point I was trying to make to people was, um, you know, understanding who they are, whether they're an investor or a speculator, because I think, uh, you know, the two are very, very different skills and a lot of people get confused thinking they're one, but in their DNA, they're the other. And if, and if you have that kind of that push and pull inside you, it makes things very, very difficult. You yeah. know, speculators are much more short-term oriented and, and investors are much slower, more diligent, more long-term. And if you, if you think you're an investor, but you focus on the price, it's, it's a really tricky ride. You, you threw in some macro statistics in that and sort of like highlighted like if, as a gold investor, if you're a speculator and investor, your, your profile looks very differently, how you look at the gold price as well. I thought that was a really interesting topic. It was towards the 35 minute mark, I believe it, it, it was when you talked about that. Like run, run us through that. Like how can you look differently at the gold price? Isn't the gold price just the gold price? Well, I, I, look, I don't look at the gold price. I mean, that was one of the key points I was trying to make. As an investor, you know, I want to own gold and I don't own it because of the price. I don't own it because I'm expecting to sell it at a certain level. You know, that's much more speculation for me. And I think I think the thing you're referring to, I was making the point that, um, well, I told, I told my own personal story with gold. I bought my first gold in 2003. I paid $333 an ounce for, for a gold coin. Uh, and I've been buying it ever since. And the, and the point I made was back then in 2003, the Dow was trading 8,500. Uh, I would have had to give up 25 ounces of gold to buy one unit of the Dow. If you, you take a dollar per point on the Dow. Um, today, with that with that same gold, the Dow's at an all time high of thirty nine two fifty. When I put the presentation together, gold was at twenty four hundred dollars an ounce. It cost me sixteen ounces of gold to buy that same unit of the Dow. So even with the Dow all time highs, if I just owned the gold and just left it sitting on deposit uh, in a safety deposit box, the Dow all time highs is thirty six percent cheaper today than it was back in two thousand three. And that and that it, the, the price is irrelevant. The gold, you know, I went through the same with housing. You know, housing. Unaffordable housing in the US, the median home price, um, is 71% cheaper in gold terms than it was in 2003. So I just try and help people understand that it doesn't matter about the price. It's not the most important reason to own gold, unless you're a speculator. If you are, then it becomes everything. That's what I mean. Like, those are two ways to look at the gold price. Correct. Right? Exactly. And uh, is the gold price expensive right now? Is the gold, well, the, the price gold is expensive the price. right now. The price right? is the price. The price is what it is. You know, and or again, even in a historic context, maybe. No, I, and this is this is the crux of my point. When you ask if gold is expensive right now, the gold is, let's call it $2,400 an ounce. Is that expensive? Well, are you an investor or a speculator? If you want to own gold, if you're an investor and you think that gold is going to preserve your purchasing power over the next 10, 15, 20 years, gold is probably not expensive right now. If you're a speculator, you could look at the charts and say, hey, you know, I'm looking at this, I'm looking at that, I can see why gold may have run too far and maybe this price is too high. It's a, they're two completely different mindsets and understanding which of those you are and what your primary objectives are is the first thing you need to do before you get involved. Well, you were also running some, you know, as through the US debt situation and all that. Like, how, how does that factor in, like, into the decision making process when you look at the gold price for you as well in particular? Like, lay, lay out your thesis a bit. How did you end up sort of at the end where you look at the gold price? Well, well for me personally, I looked at 2000, the dot-com burst, and 2001 recession, you know, post 9-11. And I looked at the response from the Federal Reserve, and it was obvious to me. And having lived in Japan and followed Japan for many years and watched what the Bank of Japan had done, it was very clear that QE and unorthodox monetary policy was going to be the way forward. And that the thing that I needed to do was protect my purchasing power against debasement. Um, so that's what gold was for me. It was it was protection, and it was a it was a means by which to store my excess capital. You know, um, I was at the time where there was no interest rates available, 
So there was no real opportunity cost in holding gold. Um, and so, you know, the worse the debt gets, the higher the debt gets, the more uh, need there will be for debasement of the currency and the more protection I'm going to need for my purchasing power. So that's really what took me to gold. Have investors pushed up gold or speculators? Uh, well, look, I don't, I don't think investors push up gold. The thing that I think is not necessarily pushing gold up, but the thing that's putting a floor under it, which makes it very interesting, is central banks. Central banks are... Um, have become voracious buyers of gold in the last uh, two, three years, so really since the Russian uh, assets were confiscated by the Treasury. So you know, I, I don't think investors really push the price up. I think speculators push the price up. Um, investors really aren't as price sensitive as speculators. So they don't follow the price on the chart quite as much. I, I'm just throwing uh, like central banks into the investor category. Because they've been constantly buying, but they're they're not buying for a trade. Like they're not <coughs> buying gold at sixteen hundred to sell at twenty three hundred. No, they're not. Right. They're not. So they're, they're protecting their purchasing power, as you said. Like and, well, and maybe no, hedge against that. the US it's dollar. Right? You know what they're doing. What they're doing right now um, is they're protecting themselves against the possibility, not probability, but possibility that they could be denied access to their reserves, as we've seen Russia be. You know, once once the Treasury froze those Russian central bank assets. That created a need for every central bank in the world to make sure that they couldn't have the same thing done to them, friend or foe right now. You know, you could be the, 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 the biggest friend of the United States right now, but you don't know what's going to happen 10 years down the track, five years down the track, one year down the track. You know, and you may be in disagreement with their policies and they could do the same thing to you. And so that creates an imperative. It's not a decision. It's not a trade. It's not protecting purchasing power. It's protecting access to our sovereign reserves. You laid out a couple of theses for the possible road ahead. And I think we need to look at that as well. Like we are where we are right now. I don't think we need to, you know, dread on the history, like in how we, how we got here. I think everybody knows that we talked about it plenty of times here on SOAR financially. But the the road ahead, like strong commodities, bull market is like the first bullet item you you, you mentioned. What does that look like, and what, what's driving that? When you talk commodities, what, what's the number one commodity you think of? Well, I, I, I think the I think the setup for a commodities bull market is is about as good as it's been. Nobody owns them. Um, we have inflation now embedded in the system. We have central banks, as I say, needing to diversify out of dollar assets. So, you know, I can see a case for a weak dollar. I can see a case for uh, for strong commodities based on, on multiple things, based on inflation, based on people trying to protect supply lines and protect um, and secure access to vital commodities in a world where globalization is becoming deglobalization and COVID's given us all a look at what happens when supply chains get disrupted and you can't get access to, to things and we've seen now that central banks need to, to diversify out of US dollar bonds uh, in the form of treasury so they're selling treasuries what can you do with that cash you know gold is the perfect solution but it's it's not doesn't make sense for them to put all their reserves into gold but something like copper, for example, you know, we've seen in the 2000s, the Chinese built up an enormous copper mountain because they knew they were going to have to use that copper for infrastructure. And it's, for certain central banks, it's a great way of storing dollar reserves. So, um, yeah, look, I think the, the, the big caveat, as I said in the presentation, is lower growth around the world. You know, I expect to see recessionary condition, uh, conditions metastasize around the world, and I expect to see that be a drag on growth. But the response to that is going to be more stimulus, uh, and that... I suspect is when you're going to see inflation really kick in, and that will, I suspect, drive commodities significantly higher. When you talk commodities, just to clarify, you mentioned gold and copper. Do you throw anything else into that basket? No, it's, it's it, a commodities bull market is going to lift all boats, right? It's going to take commodities higher. Everyone needs to look at the individual commodities they want to get involved in. For me, I focus on precious metals. You know, I look at copper as a barometer for base metals and base commodities because I think it's the easiest one to look at. Some people specialize in tin and zinc and lithium and all these other things. It's totally fine. But for me, I'm more, more, much more focused on precious metals and particularly gold. When, when you mention recessionary conditions, like depending on who you talk to and what data you look at, you can always find a, a data point that sort of fits the narrative, of course. We might be in a recession already to a degree, depending on where you look. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, what do recessionary conditions look like for you? And how will it play out? How are we going to feel it? And how are we going to see it? Well, look. I mean, every recession in history started before it was called. Right. Mm -hmm. That's just how it works. The MBER are the arbiter of recessions, and and they will tell you, <laughs> oh, the recession started back here. So, yeah, of course, we could always be in a recession. Um, you know, I, I think we have this weird situation where economic statistics look okay, but under, if you dig into any of them, you scratch below the surface in any of them, payrolls growth, employment, anything, um, you will find signs that all is not well. And, um, you know, I just, I just have this feeling, 
uh, you know, Danielle DiMartino Booth was speaking here, and she she's convinced that we're already in a recession, and she could be absolutely right. But the one thing you know is a recession's coming. We don't know when it's going to be. This is you know, this, the business cycle is exactly that. It's a cycle, so it it it, it, it troughs in recession. Um, uh, and one is coming our way. We haven't had one for a while. The last one was truncated, thanks to the kind of policies that we've talked about already. And I think it will they will attempt to truncate the next one with the same policies. And I just, I don't think they're going to be as uh, efficacious as they were the first time around. Yeah. Let's put it that way. I was going to say, like, what, what camp are you in? I, know, I think we can take no landing off the table, but are you more in a camp like soft landing, hard landing? And what? how do you define those two scenarios? I, I think the conditions and... Uh, and the setup is uh, just way too tricky for it to be a soft landing. I mean, you can never say never. It's never a 0% chance, right? There's, there's, there's not a 0% chance with no landing. I put that yes. as fanciful, but you, can, you just can't say it will definitely not happen. I think it's the most unlikely scenario. I think a soft landing is the, is the next least likely scenario. Uh, then I put a common or garden recession, and then I put a hard landing. Um, but, you know, I suspect the recession is coming. And... The danger with this one is that all the kind of past sins of of, uh, of absolution that have been kind of thrown at markets to try and stop previous recessions, they may all bear out in this next one. So the next one could be a doozy. How, how do you define a hard landing? Like, what, what kind of conditions do need to be met? Is it seven percent unemployment, eight percent, ten percent, or maybe even just five percent? Like, look, from from the conditions we're in now and the conditions we've seen, a hard landing. It's a relative thing, right? I mean, it's a relative thing. We've been through so many years of relative peace and tranquility that a common or garden recession will feel like a hard landing. Look at Australia. Australia hasn't had a recession for 30 odd years, right? Any recession is going to feel like a hard landing to Australia. So, you know, look, people get caught up in hard landing, soft landing, all these ideas because they want to be able to classify something in a very easy way that makes it easy to understand. A recession is a recession. People lose jobs, companies go bankrupt, credit gets tight. We all know what happens in a recession. We'll know if it's a hard landing, if it feels really, really bad. Um, and and we'll know, based on the response to the measures put in place to try and alleviate it, whether it's going to be sticky or not. But, you know, a recession is coming um, and, and people need to be prepared for that. Where do you look for cracks? Like, what kind of data points do you use or indicators, leading, lagging? What, what, what do you look for? No, I think uh, <laughs> it, this is very difficult because, as I said, the, the recession is always announced after the fact, right? So I think you have, to, you have to look at employment, which is a lagging indicator, obviously. You have to look at credit markets. I think they're a very good way to... Um, and again, anecdotal data. I mean, look, because the fact that the recession gets called after the fact, it's not like you position yourself for a recession and then one day you're right. You know, you have to act as if you feel, if you sorry, you, you have to act in a way that if you feel there's a recession, either here or imminent, you'll be protected by it. And so the data is the data. Um, everyone can interpret it differently. You know, every, every time we have a payroll number, you'll get 25 different people interpreting it 25 different no. ways. You need to find the people that you trust and dig deep the, enough. There, there was a statistic that fits your narrative. Of course there is. Right? Of course there is. So, you know, it, it, there's a great fascination with being right about the recession. Uh, the simple truth is, it's not about being right about the recession. It's about either making money or not losing money, depending on what your particular aim is through that happening. And... If you're trying to protect money to protect your capital and you position yourself for a recession too early, well, guess what? You're not going to lose money, but you're not going to, you may miss out on some gains. And for most people with that mindset, that's absolutely fine, right? Getting off the train two stops before it smashes into the wall, there's no problem with that. Yeah. It, it, ne nobody ever got poor taking money off the table. Or no, gains that's off right. the table, right? That's so, right. taking profits, right? Correct. Gun to your head, Grant. Are we in a recession or not? What does Grant Williams think? Do I think we're in a recession? Oh, yeah. I, I, if we're not, we can see it from here. How's that? <laughs> okay, there you go. Political answer. There you go. Well, I, I mean, I, how, you, yeah. it's impossible to say, right? I mean, because yeah. everyone's the 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 definition of a recession is two quarters of negative growth. Yeah. But yeah. is that really the be all and end all arbitrary? I don't yeah. think so. No. You're the right person to ask about the U.S. debt situation. I think. Like, is it going to implode, or do we just should not care about it? Now, you're really trying to get me with all these buzzwords, aren't you? <laughs> I know. Uh, like should we not bingo. care about it? No, we should absolutely care about it. And I think that's the problem. People don't care about it because the number's so big, right? And once the numbers become that big, people tend to kind of gloss over and go, oh, well, it's, 
it's either too big a problem or, well, if it's got that big, it can't be a problem. We absolutely need to worry about the US debt situation. Absolutely. Uh, when do we need to worry about it? Now. When is it going to matter? Who knows? No. But it will. It will no. matter. Ultimately, it will matter. And if we look at, I had some of the data in my presentation yesterday, you know, that with, with interest rates here, um, you know, there's a trillion dollars of debt service costs uh, that the US has to pay now with 150 basis points of rate cuts by next quarter, by the first quarter of 2025, that's 1.2 trillion. <laughs> with no rate cuts, it's $1.7 trillion in six months. That's a big, big problem. So yes, it matters. Um, does it matter today? To some people, yes. But everybody is going to decide it matters when they see credit ratings get downgraded, which is starting to happen, or the dollar start to fall out of bed, which potentially could happen. You know, everyone has a different signal, which means it matters to them. I couldn't squeeze the question in earlier, but uh, you, you mentioned U.S. family office and strategic allocations in your presentation, and uh, that it's really under allocated to commodities in particular. How do we change that? What, what could trigger a change? Uh, high prices. High right? prices. Prices move up. If things become <laughs> sexy, if things become in focus, then people want to allocate to it. You know, that's why, if you, if you look at that chart that you're talking about, you know, there's 1% allocated to commodities. There's a ton of it uh, allocated to real estate and private equity and private credit, which are all the things that have been sexy the last few years. That's, that's the nature of the beast, right? I mean, particularly with family offices. Family offices um, tend to go uh, where the interest is and they have all these people calling them with great deals for them and they all tend to be in the hot spaces. So, you know, at some point in time, that hot space is going to be commodities and then the, and then the family offices will move towards them. Good, good follow-up to that is $6 trillion are sitting in money, in money market funds making about 5% easy money pretty much right um once a fed rate cut hits maybe that to return might diminish is that when we start reallocation to commodities is that what is that a possibility <coughs> Look, everything's a possibility kai you know i mean mm. uh, when that when that number falls from five percent yeah the question you have to ask is, yeah the question you have to ask yourself is why <laughs> why is it fallen if it's fallen because everything's fallen off a cliff mm. and the fed are cutting rates because going into recession people might be happy with four percent you know rather than take the risk so yeah everybody wants a clear-cut yes or no answer to every question and they don't exist right. and anyone that wants to give you one is <laughs> disingenuous because they don't point, exist yeah. right so you can answer yes or no to every single question huh. everybody it's incumbent upon all of us to think for ourselves and work out okay if that happens am i happy with this there, there are no simple answers there are no formulas that you can follow that mean it's going to be okay and if we do go into recession, given the nature of the beast that we're facing, you better have a good plan for what you need to do to protect your own assets. What is your plan? What is my plan? Because yeah, we can't give a general financial advice, so we got to talk about you personally. Well, how are you allocating for the next six months, maybe? I, I've, I've been buying gold for 23 years, and it's performed incredibly well for me, right? And I've been accumulating it. I've never sold an ounce of gold. Um, I've been in and out of shares i've been in and out of bonds i've got some private loans and stuff but everything i have is something that i know inside out and i'm happy with the credit and i'm happy with the risk and i sleep very very well at night and i, and I don't take flyers on things like nvidia and tesla because everyone else is doing it you know i'm a very idiosyncratic investor and i'm, and I'm very very happy that way Fantastic. Grant, we're out of time, sadly. And uh, I'm so appreciative that you took the time to just sit down with us here at the World Symposium. Thank you so much. It was always a pleasure. I forgot to squeeze in a question about Japan because we talked about it, Japan at length in, in January. We did, that's right. Uh, we need to do a catch up or a follow up later we'll on. Because uh, the situation in Japan is ever changing and Very maybe more rate hikes coming. So it's really interesting and fun to watch because you're the only person I can talk to about this. Oh, like, you'll, you better find plenty of people. Don't worry. But you're the only person I have talked to okay. about this. Okay, right. let's, let's keep it like that. Um, everybody else, I hope you enjoyed this. This shorter interview with Grant Williams, but so much dense information. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back with lots more here from the World Symposium.